Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today's conversation is from a class that I've been giving on Sudul Kahf, many of you may know. And uh, this is such an important class to understand Sudul Kahf in terms of the future technology. I, fee I feel very uh, strongly about it, and that's why I'm making this recording before the, the, the clip of the, the class session starts. If it's a boring class, please watch all of it. If it's not a boring class, please share it with other people. It is extremely important to understand the role between what Sutil Kahaf is alluding to in terms of the future, especially in terms of manufacturing, in terms of the uh, <coughs> technology that will be manufactured in the, in the future. <coughs> and uh, just uh, also, I want to mention that, you know, of course, uh, YouTube has come down on me and, you know, it's given me a warning, so I do need to be a little bit more careful. So, uh, that is just uh, in reference to the fact that a lot of people have been saying to create an alternative, you know, in BitChute and, and so on and so forth. And I'm thinking about that, so those people that want to help me out in getting other alternative platforms, um, I already have one brother, you know, I'm paying him pennies, like maybe like less than $100 a month. Uh, to help me as far as, uh, you know, and I do have uh, all of my videos in another place. Um, and uh, please read the comment in the description session section. Uh, but I'm also putting a link for anybody that wants to help me, help me. If Allah puts it in your heart that you should help me to keep, you know, this thing going. And then my regular list listeners, what I want is the people that are my regular listeners, they should not listen to me on YouTube. They should listen to me uh, whenever they get a chance or whenever they're reminding themselves they should listen to me on the alternative uh, uh, sites so uh, you know so that way you're used to that and then that way I can continue with my audience in case uh, YouTube comes down hard upon me and so you know whatever happens is, is the will of Allah everything eventually ends but one day this channel is going to end anyway so whatever Allah wants me to do will happen, and whatever Allah doesn't allow me to do will not happen. You know, MashaAllah uh, can. You know, what Allah wants will happen. What Allah wants will not happen. What Allah doesn't want will not happen. Period. Having said this, this is a very important class. Please watch all of it. It's about the future of technology. It's about where we're going. It's about. Uh, and its relationship to the Dajjal and Sutil Kahab. And then one last time, if you want to give, give. If you don't want to give, it's okay, alhamdulillah. Because I'm only going to get whatever Allah wants me to get. Not a cent more, not a cent less. So no matter what means I establish, but I want to use that money to get into other platforms and other places and to be able to pay this one brother uh, for the work that he's doing, inshallah ta'ala. Okay? So now let's continue here, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Okay. This is the verse that I want to talk about today, inshallah. Very important verse of Allah. Very, 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 in, ter in terms of the times that we live in. Qul, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say to them, should I tell you? The worst, the losers in terms of deeds. They think they're doing something good. But what are they doing? Their efforts, they went to not, they went to complete destruction. It, everything went against against them. Their, their, all their efforts in the life of this world. But they were calculating, they were thinking that they were most beautiful, most perfect in sunnah. Sunnah literally, literally means manufacturing. But our, our old scholars probably didn't, I mean, why would it say manufacturing? Sunnah. Sunnah means, you know, sanaat. We even say in Urdu, sanaat. Sanaat means manufacturing. Let's see what this brother has translated this as, because to perform, to produce. So produce is like manufacturing, but that is the actual, to those people whose efforts are lost, 
because of what they manufacture. Manufacturing fake news, manufacturing fake wars, manufacturing fake drugs, manufacturing, and all in the name of good. We're doing something good. Okay. Now, also manufacturing junk science, science that looks like it's going to be very helpful to us, but in the end of the day, it's not helpful to us at all. Those people whose efforts have been completely wasted because the narrative of the world is this is the way to go. This is the right thing to do. This is the way to success. This is the great reset. This is the way to go forward. And they had calculated. They had measured. They had thought. Okay. That they were that they were the most best, the most perfect in manufacturing. Those whom their efforts are made into zero. Their efforts are made into zero in the life of this world. Because they were thinking, they were calculating, they were hoping, they were planning on Nahum. How did they get forward in the world, in this world of material world? You have to manufacture something. You have to manufacture uh, you know, a computer virus. You have to uh, manufacture something to get ahead, to put others down. And they thought this is a good thing. They convinced themselves, you know, Zuyina lahum a'ma lahum. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made their good, their deeds look good to them. It could be the worst thing in the world, but they, Allah makes the deeds that they do look good to them. And then Allah describes these people. These are the people who have done kufr. They have disbelieved in the signs of Allah. Why? Because everything they did was to compete against the signs of Allah. But if Allah gave you natural cure through flowers and through other means, instead of doing research there, no, you want to make your synthetic stuff. And to meet him. Then all their good deeds, what they saw as good deeds, their good deeds will be become zero. Habitat destroyed. And then there will not be for them on the day of judgment. And there will be not anything qa'im for them. They have no qiyam, they have no standing, they have no uh, weight. So there will be not for them any weight on the day of judgment. You won't be able to go and say, I made this product, I manufactured this product, I made this, you know, great thing, and I made the best bombs in the world, you know, so I did it for the good of humanity, because I made the atomic bomb, and then World War II stopped because of uh, my bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and then if you can justify that, then, you know, mad scientists can justify anything, that will have no weight on the day of judgment. There will, be, there will be no weight for them, meaning themselves, meaning Allah will weigh the person, according to some of the narrations, or he will weigh their good deeds. There will be no weight for them, no good deeds for them, nothing for them in the day of judgment. Who is this for? Those people who manufacture. Who are the people that manufacture? Like the man in the garden. He worked and he manufactured the system that he thought was perfect. You know, with the date palm trees around, the rivers running through, and the crops and the, you know, the best fruits of, of the grapes, you know, the best grapes there. It is perfectly designed. What can go wrong? What can go wrong? And so this is what happens when you what you do kufr of the ayat of Allah. It ends up. It starts with kufr of Allah, the kufr of the ayat of Allah, denying the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then what happens as a result? It starts with the denial of the signs of Allah and ends up manufacturing things 
that you think you can make better than what Allah has made. This is where it ends. And so this is, now with this in mind, now I have a few other things to share with you in this regard. Should we tell you, and this, you know, shall we tell you, we tell you, you all. Here's plural. You know, in the surah, the whole of the surah, most of the surah is talking to the Prophet. I'm Hasibta, O Prophet, did you think? O Prophet, this, O Prophet, that, the whole surah. But when it comes to this verse, what is interesting is, should we tell you the truth of what will happen? The worst losers when it comes to thinking that you're doing something good. Right? Alladhi, those people, so much struggle they made. You know, they went warp speed. They did this, they did that, they ran here, they did this. Yeah. Whose efforts, whose, whose struggle has been lost in the hayat of dunya. But they were thinking, they were calculating what home that they were, what yursiluna, that they were so perfect in their manufacture. They were so, they thought they were so perfect in manufacture. And so, over here is really like if somebody is in living in the times and he's seeing through the nur of Allah, meaning through the ayat of Allah, and he's seeing, oh, well, do you know they really struggle to manufacture? If anything is being manufactured, uh, at some point it's going to face problems because Allah said so. That's how I read it, right? In terms of the fiqhul waqiyah, in terms of the understanding of the times. And there's another aspect to this, which is very uh, important. I will talk about that after I show you something, okay? I'm gonna show you this thing and then I, I want you to understand that where humanity is and why humanity thinks that it can challenge God. In this okay. so, can everyone hear me? Yes, can you sh can you mute everyone, please? Okay, yes. Okay, maybe inshallah. So, Bismillah wa rahmanullah. Let me show you all this, and this will shock you all. Um, let me just get it here. Oh, one route to that is through. Now, remember, uh, this was published in 2016. So this has nothing to do with the situation we're in, but you will now be amazed, okay? Of the things that they're able to do now. So now here, I'm gonna give you a glimpse of some of that. And here are probably two of the Achilles heel points in the design, but if they surmount those, they will probably achieve what they say they want to do. So that's a little bit of what this is about. Um, I was going to give you my thoughts on mind, body, and beyond, gene slicing, uh, the Dr. Ventner's work, uh, DNA encryption, uh, operating system since the time you were little. So, uh, I'll only give you the highlights here. This is a monkey that is able to only with his brain move arms and feed himself. Only with his brain. However, You'll see where there this has is been going. a plan in many labs to figure out how do we help people whose bodies don't work in the way that they want them to do, who have neurologic defects. Could you uh, start the first video? So as a way of surmounting that, people are experimenting five or six years so ago, as early as 2008, on basis. Um, with whether or not you can do a brain robotic interface. I don't know if there's a volume for that. ...that we go through with our monkeys as they go through and try to learn how to use this robot. 
So they're using um, brain signals, so signals from their motor cortex that we um, pull out of, of wires into our system, and our computers then um, decode what it is that, that the monkey is intending to do and uh, drive the endpoint of this arm forward and backward and around through space. The monkeys have brain control over this robotic arm to uh, move it forward and grab a piece of fruit as it's presented and then bring it back to their mouth uh, to feed themselves. Incredible as it may seem, these monkeys learned to feed themselves with a robot arm that was being directly controlled by their brains, as if it was simply part of them. This is a biofeedback closed loop kind of experiment and that there's an automatic, almost an automatic learning that's going on um, where we're communicating with the... So essentially, um, when you're little and you're growing up and you're learning how to work your appendages, you are making good motor neuron... ...electrical impulses in the brain. We want to be able to record those electrical impulses and then decode what what the electrical impulses mean and use that to control an object or an arm. People have thought for a long time that we might be able to tap into the brain, but it's only recently that we've gotten closer and closer. Uh, there's some great work going on here at the University of Pittsburgh by a, a gentleman named Andy Schwartz. And Andy has shown that he can get a monkey to control a robotic arm with an amazing degree of freedom by thought. So we've developed technology where we can implant an array of electrodes, microelectrodes, in the cerebral cortex of monkeys. And we can record activity from many neurons in the brain simultaneously. And from that signal, we can extract the monkey's intention to move its arm. And now that we have that, we can have intercept that signal and use it, instead of moving the monkey's own arm, to use it to move a prosthetic arm. Just two weeks. Yeah. I think he said it actually. What it takes to really get into people is a, is a large team. So we've... Been I want to know that number. ...is at first she had to walk on the treadmill to keep the robot walking that she could observe <coughs> on the computer screen. And then she just stopped walking and it would run the robot in Japan. So... This is mind control over medicine. like... You can quickly see... Over like space. Now watch this. Right. They're playing with motor function and linking it to thought. So the next step, really, when you think about it, was to um, simultaneously try it with uh, another, another non-human animal and find out if she could run a robot on the other side of the planet. And the essence of this experiment is, at first, she had to walk on the treadmill to keep the robot walking that she could observe on the computer screen. And then she just stopped walking, and it would run the robot in Japan. So you can have a brain here in the United States plugged in, running a robotic device, a mechanical device, via the internet somewhere else in the world. So that was pretty cool. It also has some fun implications. If you see now, where do you imagine this going when you think of it as an offensive or defensive opportunity with respect to the intelligence community? The natural segue then would be, if I can send motor function from a brain to a mechanical arm, is it possible to send motor functions from one human to another human. So I call it the possession experiment. Now, this is very interesting, the possession experiment. Because if you can control another being through your mind, then imagine what the Shaolin can do. Just imagine what the Shaolin can do, especially if you're training your mind for that type of situation. You know, you're literally training yourself or you're going to be literally training yourself in the future to be possessed to allow yourself to be possessed and i can tell you this is going to be really devastating for human beings and the real issue when it comes to iman i'm going to talk about in the end once i show you everything i'm trying to show you and how this connects to the god It's on it's that one, yeah. Just to hover the, uh, there you go, right there. Oh. For our weekly tech. Remember, all this is before COVID. This is not COVID era. This is 2016. This is just where technology is going.
report. Now, do you know the phrase brain power? Well, it turns out that scientists at the University of Washington are trying to hone that power and transmit it to another brain. Researchers call it direct brain to brain communication, and they do it by passing a signal from one mind to the next using the internet nonetheless. So does it sound a little sci-fi, Star Trek my Mel, Jedi mind trick Inception-esque to you? Well, it did to me too. So I brought one of the researchers onto the show to tell me how it works. Dr. Andrea Stoko is an assistant research professor at the University of Washington, and he told me why this concept is not as weird as it sounds. Oh, uh, it's not so science fiction. We use uh, current existing technologies to read uh, the brain patterns in a person and uh, to transmit them to a different person. And we can only do it. By the way, the process is actually very easy. They already do R RMIs and CAT scans of the brain. So when they see that pattern, all they have to do is see patterns in the brain. They tell the computer, look, when you see this pattern, this is what you have to move. This is how you need to move. So you know, they'll put somebody on an MRI or an you know, EGG or a PET scan of some sort and tell them, okay, move your right arm. Okay, move your right arm. Okay, move your right arm. And they tell them, okay, move your left arm. And they'll see where the difference is. They'll take a picture of that. Now they'll put that picture into a computer. So now recognize, it's not they're actually going into your brain. They're seeing the output of the brain. And by seeing the output of the brain, they're able to say, okay, when you have this output within the brain in terms of the electromagnetic uh, sensors that they have, then you make this movement because this is what this person is thinking. So now just keep this in mind. Very simple uh, impulses right now, like motor commands, take control. So you see the brain is there, it's attached to these electrodes and then they get the EEG recording. And then whenever that EEG recording repeats with another person, they automatically say, okay, this is what this is, this is what the person's so trying to do or trying to say or, you know. The hand, for instance. So it's not that science fiction. It was definitely possible years ago <laughs> that, that we were the first to try it. Sure. So can you go into a little bit more detail about how specifically it works, or what you need from the person, and also what you need from mm -hmm. wireless internet to, to make it come together? Yes. Uh, it works more or less like this. A person is sitting on a chair, and we call this person the first brain or the sender, and is connected to an EEG cap. The EEG cap detects electrical activity all around the brain and is capable of recognizing when the brain patterns are those that a person produces when he's trying to move the right hand or is thinking about moving the right hand. These brain patterns are interpreted by a computer who then controls a second computer who is connected over the internet, and the second computer action, uh, controls a stimulating coil that produces a magnetic field. And it's the magnetic field that is eventually directed over the head in such a way as to reproduce a particular command in a I will share with you one event in my life. Uh, I was dealing with a gin case maybe about 12, 13 years ago. One of the gins that got involved he was a Muslim gin. And I think this was the time when Batman had come out. Now, usually, sometimes when I do like a very heavy gin case that, you know, I just need my mind off of it because of things that you go through sometimes. So in those days, they were playing the movie Batman, okay? Batman had come out and, you know, I grew up on, you know, watching the, this, these, um, you know, these kind of like, uh, I grew up watching uh, the superheroes and, you know, and it kind of like had a big effect on my mindset because in those days, not like today where you have dead pool and you have people with powers and they're not even good guys. When I was growing up, at least there was some fitra. There was some fitra there. So, you know, these are people like Superman, Batman, Spider-Man. They fight evil, right? You know, and they're fighting evil. And so this concept really like, I think, became an intrinsic part of uh, who I am because of those cartoons to some degree. Anyway, and, uh, you know, I always liked this kind of like, you know, good versus evil uh, kind of like a theme, which is a, a normal human theme in general, but I grew up with it. And so, uh, along with some other people, so, you know, Batman was playing, I was like, let's go watch Batman to get my mind off of this whole scenario. Well, anyway, in the process, one of the jinns uh, who claimed to be a Muslim, I don't know, but he claimed this, which makes more sense 
uh, as time goes by. One of the jinns claims, you know what that man does? That's what we want human beings to do. We want human beings to be able to do the things that that man does. And then the jinn continued to say, we already do the things that that man does. They're just trying to copy us. They're trying to like be it. like he was the jinn was trying to tell me, you humans are trying to like be like jinns. And that's why, you know, you're gonna like uh he didn't say technology or anything, but he's like, you're gonna try to be like us. You're gonna try to be like us, you're gonna try to be like that man. And this is what this technology does. The rich will be able to buy this technology and be far superior than the poor man who can't buy this technology because there's a very important aspect to this, which is a very important book written by a sociologist, uh, which I can uh, share with you very, very quickly. His name is Alvin Topper. Alvin, Alvin Top, uh, Topper. It's called the Future Shock. Okay. And uh, Future Shock uh, is a book that we had to study when we were in college and university. Uh, but Future Shock is about the idea that, in fact, I'm going to share with you another book that relates to this whole situation, uh, which is Jurassic Park, Jurassic, the book, um, the same book. And I'll tell you how this relates to my life also, because I had to take a class that actually taught this book too, and I'll share, share with you why in a second. Uh, Jurassic Park, okay, and how these two are interrelated, and how this all relates to Sudrika. Uh, I'll come to this inshallah in a second. But I was telling you that the future shock is a book that talks about the future and what will happen with technology and uh, the class of mankind. Okay, so what's going to happen is is that human beings resist culture i mean culture resists change that's the rule culture resists change so now my computer is going x fast why do i need windows 11 12 13 14. why am i going to change my computer when my computer is doing fine culture resists change i'm not going to want to change technology every time there's a new technology i'm not going to most people are not going to just jump and buy it as a result of the future shock which is that the shock is that there comes a point you're so fast, right? That it's undetected. This the difference in speed is undetectable by human experience. Meaning, um, if only up to a certain degree can my ears hear the you can say the nuances of differences in the sound from one speaker to another speaker, from one generation of speakers to another generation. Same thing with the camera. Camera can get so good that it's beyond the human capability to see. You can say in technology wise it's better, but in terms of human experience, it can only go so far. You know, internet's fast, but now uh, the difference between, let's say, uh, a fast computer and a really fast computer is so little that it doesn't bother me. I don't think I need to spend an extra hundred dollars just to get the next greatest thing. So what happens as a result is that uh, the people that are poor, right? or the people that are even middle class, they're like, well, you know, we can do without this. And only the rich and the famous get faster and faster and faster and better and better and better technology because they have the money to do it and they have the money to, to waste, so to say like that. But what ends up happening is because now less people are buying technology, what happens to the prices? The prices go up. Now the poor people can't afford them at all. And because the masses are not buying them, now only the elite are buying them. So now something becomes very elitist. Technology in the future will become elitist. And so there are many aspects to all of this thing that I'm sharing with you and how it relates to the God. This is one aspect that as technology co continues, less and less people are going to buy technology because they're happy with what they got. And only the people who really, you know, will buy the next iphone because oh well you know i have the money to do it so why not right and so that's that's one aspect the other aspect that i want to share with you is this uh this was is a class i actually took in high school it was called um science society and technology and the main theme of this book jurassic park as you know the movie is also on there's a movie on this book but the main theme of this is if you play with nature if you challenge nature, something will go wrong. And that's the whole point of Jurassic Park. 
is they found the DNA of old dinosaurs and they brought them back into an island alive. And what it ended up doing is it ended up creating havoc and killing people and creating a big mess. And then it even left the DNA, the DNA somehow left that island, and went to other places of the world. And now that was going to create more problems. But the book kind of like ends at that point. So you play with the, and this happens. When does this happen? When you play with nature like this, when you do gene splicing. And I'm going to show you a little bit more of that video so that it becomes clear how far this can go. Because this, even what he said right now, is not the, the farthest it can go. And this gene splicing and this CRISP and manipulating uh, the, the, the genes and the RNA, this is like really playing God, right? This is like you're not any more benefiting from nature because that's what used to happen. That's the other thing I want to share with you. There is something called uh, biomimicking. Mm -hmm. Biomimicking is how human beings always achieve, achieve technology. We saw nature do it. We see how nature does it. And we make technology based upon how nature is doing it. Up to this point, science is good. Okay. Up to this point, it is good. So, for example, uh, you want to, biomimicry is the practice of looking to nature for inspiration to solve design problems. So, you know, there are many, many examples of this. Uh, let's see if I can uh, give you an example. So the uh, nature of that, but like for example, they made a train, okay? The nose of the train is designed based upon a bird that goes into the, jumps from the, goes, flies from the air into the sea, okay? Without causing any friction. So when they make these super fast uh, trains, uh, when a train would be going and then it's going through a tunnel, for example, then there would be this friction and it would cause problems. So then they designed the nose of that train based upon what they saw in nature, this bird do. Okay, so always, you know, the, 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 the son of Adam Ali when he killed his brother, he looked at nature for inspiration. So what should I do? Nature has always, we wanted to fly because we saw birds. Then we studied birds. How did they fly? Then we try to copy that. Okay. And so this has been happening for thousands of years. Where we have copied nature, copied nature, copied nature. This is an acknowledgement that nature can teach us. This is an acknowledgement that the ayat of Allah know better. Okay. But what we're doing now with science is to say we know better than nature. We can challenge nature. We're not going to and learn from nature, rather we're going to manipulate nature. This is where we're now going. So this should be clear in your minds, okay? So this biomimicry, if you get a chance, go to this website, and maybe I'll make some videos now that it just came to my mind because I haven't uh, uh, looked at this stuff for many, many years. I mean, it's been like eight, nine years. I haven't even touched it. So, but, you know, these are things that I learned when I was young. And so um, <clears throat> now, uh, let us continue, inshallah, over here. Let me show you the next case. The let's let's go back to the Quran, inshallah. Soon. It's called the decoder. Well, this animal has the lucky job of not having to do anything for getting a reward. The only thing it has to do is to receive this brain activity uh, into its own brain and then decode the pattern of information that the encoder has generated and indicate to us, uh, as through behavior, what it is that the first animal has discovered out there in the environment. So if the decoder gets it right, both animals get a nice uh, juicy reward. And that's what they want. And that's how they collaborate to actually get this job done. Uh, here you see in the next slide, uh, encoder animal waiting for a light stimulus that tells the animal which of two levers he has to press to get a little bit of uh, a water sip. And the light says either press left or the right lever. So when the animal gets the light and is about to press the lever, we record the activity, electrical activity, from lots of cells in the motor cortex of this animal and instantaneously transmit this information to the brain of a second animal that is in another box and cannot see the light. You get the point, cannot... but it goes further now. When you don't know how to operate a device, 
Does it serve well for covert communication? This is done between two rats. What we do know um, is that DARPA did get permission for Now, and control its motor movement. Now we're also going to talk about erasing memories, replacing memories, all of these experiments. Hold on one and second. And its tail, so you can have not. You'll see where this is going with the so You can have the human brain probably run a regular drone at this point, but uh, running a non-human drone, something like a cockroach or a rat, would it be awesome? And now the, if you were watching. That's like a gin taking over again. Keep this in mind. In the Olympics and you see the coordinated maze of drones, the software is now really readily available where you could, uh, you could have hordes of little creatures that can gain access to facilities um, or, or move around in different places, all run by a person sitting in a booth. Um, it wouldn't be, it's no more technically challenging once you do that than figuring out the logistics of how you're going to send your signal somewhere else in the world and how to protect that signal. But um, that's, that's now, that's not um, in the future. So as you begin to think what's in five, which is like an editing software for genes, makes a number of things immediately available. What he did is he programmed yeast cells to produce anything he wanted. They can produce perfume, they can produce petroleum, they can produce any peptide, anything we program the DNA to do, and it's in the living cell. Right? So in medicine, the goal in medicine now is to be able to do uh, designer medicine and therapy if we can design a cell to get into your body and release the right product for you, you won't be losing half the drugs you take through your liver when you swallow a pill and it gets digested. These can be inserted into you through the hypospray uh, needles, almost like Dr. McCoy on Star Trek, giving you the hyperspray. It just blasts now plasmids into your squamous cells. But uh, Ventner was able to do that and has the patent on the technology. But you can engineer anything. You can engineer a unique thing that would only kill one person in the world. It's how it's done. You put in a specific gene slicing, you program what you like, you put it in the cell, and it can reproduce and make as much as you like. For those of you who don't know, your DNA is usually all wrapped up in tight little coils. And so what you're doing is when they create plasmids and put them into cells, it sends a signal and tells which portion of the DNA should unwrap, unfold, and produce a product. Now, this is the future of medicine. Uh, when you look at this technology in medicine and say, this is going to be done to help people, right? We want to be able to give them medicines. We actually want to correct for genetic deficits. If a kid's born with a genetic anomaly with the CRISPR technology, the feeling is we can create the portion of the... So a, a kid is going to be born with, you know, black eyes because parents have black. Well, you know, we can do, you know, for a right price, we can make him blue eyes. Oh, and uh, we can make him more intelligent. And uh, we can make him really strong like an athlete. And uh, all we need to do is get the money. You know, this is, this is just to give you an idea. Now, where, what happens? This is the question I want you to ask yourself. What happens to people's iman in a situation like that? Who's going to say, inshallah? Who's going to say, mashallah? Who's going to say, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah? Who's going to say, la ilaha illallah? In a technology situation like that, where you can just do just about everything. It's going to reach a peak and then it's going to fall. And this is mentioned like indirectly and directly in the Quran several times. The gene they're missing and go have it spliced back in. And that may help a child either if it's in utero development or once they're older to have the missing substance actively produced. What would you do with this if you were in security and intelligence? Well, you can do a number of things. You could just, you could have the Forrest Gump gene. You guys been tracking, there's a gene that just makes you stronger. Memories from one fruit fly to another by signaling through a, a light stimulus uh, into the retina. Right now in, in most animals, it's done by putting a substance into their body uh, that will actually activate the neuron in the way that you want it. So you have the capacity to create any product, as long as you know the DNA sequence, you can insert it into a living system, and you can remotely control it. So in medicine, we think about how we do that to help people, how we do to repair deficits. Other people are gonna think about how do they do it to expand possibilities. Now, one of the challenges that we have is that when you create a cell and you put it in somebody's body, you have to figure out where you want it. What if you want it in their brain? 
right? If you want it in their brain and you can't figure out, you don't want to do surgery to plant it in their brain, if I want a product produced in your brain that may affect the way you think, the way you act, one route to that is through uh, stem cells. If you're a quick brush up on your biology, stem cells are cells, they call them God cells. By the way, there is a group of people on earth who think they're God's chosen people and everyone is a Gentile and they justify doing things like, oh, we can't take interest from our own selves, but we can take interest from the Goyim or from the others, from the Gentiles. We can enter. With that type of mindset, and they have this science, anything can happen. They can justify doing anything to anyone. They can turn into anything. They hold the potential unlike other cells in your body, to become anything you want them to become. At a very logical level, technology can be used for good or bad. But the reality of the human tragedy is that so far technology has been used for a, you know, a lot of good, yes, but does the good outweigh the bad so far? I don't know, very hard to tell. And they can go find their home in the body and park there and do the work that you'd like. But what I can logically say for sure is that there will be people who will use technology for the wrong reasons. So every wrong reason possible, and if you have the funds to do it, it will be used for that. There's absolutely no questions about that. Meaning, of course, unless Allah wills it not to, but this is this is the situation we're in. You can infuse them and they will find their way into the brain. So once you know that the technology is there to edit, splice, and program a cell, and the technology currently exists to administer it to somebody and have it go park anywhere you program it to go park, proliferate, and do its function, you can have things activated in other people's brains. So if you take these three key points, Hopefully you can see. I don't know where he it says this up. because, you know, I'm not going to have us go through the whole video. But at some point he says that freezing and cold, as you know, is happening with the vaccines currently, is used to, um, to like, basically, uh, when, when, when you freeze it, one of the benef like benefits from, a, from an intelligence perspective is that it becomes, you can do more legal things with it, basically, is what he's saying. You can put more information, you can put more, jam more information, and like the normal DNA at room temperature has more, can store more memory, okay, than a, a whole library can, okay? But when you make it colder, it can store even more memory, more programs, more things in it. So if you, you all can have access to this video, you know, it's Dr. Charlie on Psycho War or something, something I'll show you. You guys can go through this if you want on your own, but I'm just so, giving you the highlights. A number of both alarming and exciting possibilities. You can have the timed release of information on demand. Hopefully when I mention the word CRISPR and word editing and creating molecules with CRISPR out of D and playing with DNA, some of you thought encryption and encoding. So DNA encryption it, there were, I think, eight articles published by China in the course of three years, uh, in the last three years. And uh, it's uh, quite important. The coding system, DNA steganography, I'll just say short, the short story on this is people have figured out how to hide imagery in the DNA of bacteria. And when you um, phosphoresce the bacteria, you can discover the information or you can have the, those are just to remind me, you can have the information uh, reproduced in a string form as a form of a protein. Dr. Church up at Harvard uh, has shown quite well that you can store a lot of information in one gram of DNA. It's essentially, yeah, that many, that many iPads. In Seven billion iPads in a DNA, subhanAllah. But here's what happens. This is the other thing, right? If you're looking at, uh, in fact, uh, this is a book I'm editing, mashallah, um, uh, this is a book I'm editing. Uh, it's called Sociology Through Religion. And uh, he makes this point too, is that, you know, a person who ha whose ultimate concern is 
the truth and whose ultimate concern is God and the hereafter. When he looks at the universe, that's what he sees. But if, you're, if your ultimate concern is dunya and materialism, you look at the universe and think like, okay, how can I get there? How can I exploit that? I wonder what minerals are there. I wonder how much that can make me rich. Oh, you know, how, how does this fish do this? So even though you're mimicking, you're mimicking nature, but you're mimicking nature through the lens of your heart, right? So like somebody who believes in Allah, who sees nature is like, wow, right? Because that's what his ultimate concern is. Somebody who doesn't care about that, he looks at nature and is like, oh, well, if I can find out how that thing does that, if I can find out how a frog has that type of tongue uh, that can extend that long, if I can give that to human beings somehow, I mean, I can make a lot of money. Right. So, I mean, this kind of like the uh, materialistic thinking then sets into how you actually look at nature and what you look at nature for. One gram at room temperature. So we made the USB to store memory. And now they're looking at, hey, but DNA has more memory. Instead of saying, subhanAllah, like a, a DNA strand can have seven billion iPads of information. Instead of like saying, subhanAllah, this can have seven million, seven billion iPads of information. You know, Allah, you're thinking, hmm, I wonder how I can benefit myself through this. Either through doing good, even if you're doing good, which is part of what that, even if you're doing good, you're still thinking of your benefit. Like I'll make an iPad, I'll make a, a, a memory stick through DNA, for example, like some silly idea that I have. But if I do that, I'm thinking, okay, how rich can that make me? To have a small, you know, a st strand of DNA inside a USB, somehow surviving and being able to store and retrieve information. Well, if I can do that, I can become pretty rich. If I sell, sell the, you know, 700 terabytes of information uh, holder, right? Or I can look at the DNA and be enamored by, or, or, or adore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. But, it, it totally, and this is what this surah is saying, is, is, is a big portion. If you read through the surah with this in mind, it becomes clear this is one of the key messages, particularly in this surah. No supercooling required. DNA is highly stable. It's been around on the planet a very long time. So between CRISPR, the storage capacity, and programming cells, the new way to uh, hide information is going to be in DNA. The commercial application is going to be a bit like on Star Trek years ago. Why would you have a digital system when you can have a DNA system? You can store all the information you'd ever need, records, photos, anything. It's simply another way of storing information. It had just been so slow up until five years ago, it wouldn't be thought to be practical. But it is. This is the first experiment showing what imagery you can hide in bacteria. This is the latest. It's a GIF file. It was actually programmed into the DNA of bacteria last year. The bacteria reproduced, and the offspring from the reproduction cycle would still produce this movie. Pretty cool. You can hide information in bacteria. And when the bacteria multiply, they can go into a spore form and last for a very long time. No one can scan you and find a bacteria. We don't have anything that can detect that. When, you know, people, you know, so if you want to be able to encode information, take pictures of information, create something in DNA and don't want it in your own body, it can be bacteria on some portion of your body, right? All they have to do is scrape it, let it grow in the Petri dish, and unpack the information. This is all available now. This isn't science fiction, but you can encode movies. The answer is yes. Several years ago, with the PAM Zeta data out of Duke University, this was the first time that anyone had ever demonstrated that if you wash an area of the brain called the hippocampus, it's an area of our brain that's this crucial. This is talking about re re removing memories, replacing memories, and all of that. Performing short memories, special now, memories. Now, God, remember, forgetfulness is mentioned a couple of times when the young man who was with Musma Ansani in the shape no one made me forget except Shaitan. So just keep this in mind. And then facilitating the transfer from a short-term memory to something that's more permanent and stable over time, that he could 
train the mice to run the maze, document the number of trials and errors, and then yeah, what uh, this I think sister wrote is very correct. This fifth knot will be the fifth knot up ahead is far worse than we can even imagine. Far worse, far worse, far worse. I mean, uh, subhanAllah. I mean, a part of me is like, I don't know if I want to be alive. And then, you know, of course, I have children. <laughs> and so, Allah But like, what type of iman will my grandchildren have? When the jal is not out yet, malhama is basically happening. Uh, and uh, this type of technology is available at the same time. And one of the things we've learned about the modern world is you can have the most severe devastation on one side of the city and the other side of the city is enjoying the best of technology still. Like, look at Syria. One side is devastated, the other side is fine. And if you're on the fine side, you have no idea. Even though it's like you can tell what's happening thousands of miles away, but you can't tell like your own local area, right? And so the fifth and will be far worse. Um, somebody raised their hands. I thought, okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Flood their hippocampus or expose it to this and the memory would be completely gone. Meaning when the rats or the mice had to learn it over again, it was the same number of learning trials. And there was no trace of the memory left. Now the good news uh, for us when we study rats and mice is we put electrodes and cannuli into their brain and can directly affect that area of the brain. If you wanted to poke your own hippocampus, you'd have to stick your finger through your eye and go right back in there. Sounds impossible to get to. Not if you program a cell to go there. So if you decide you wanted to program something that would selectively release PKM Zeta, after your meeting with someone, they probably would have no memory of it. That's what's happening in the rats, right? So the technical challenge right now is, how do we get a cell in there to do that in human? I can assure you they're working on that in non-human primates right now. How many, what's the point specificity? Can we get it in there close enough to the hippocampus? Will those cells start reproducing in the next day, make enough of that stuff to wipe out a memory? Related to this, once you start thinking about memory, are chemicals that not only wipe out memory, but chemicals that enhance it. So if you want a better human camera, a better, uh, uh, an individual who can just go see and remember everything, uh, that's the direction that the research in this lane is taking to help people with Alzheimer's, how to give them memory back. So what's being actively studied are the few people on the planet who have hypermnesia in other words, they remember everything that's ever happened to them. We're actively trying to understand how to unlock that and unpack that and figure out why it is their memory does seem to record and they retain everything they've seen. They don't find it pleasant uh, and medicine would like to, people in medicine want to try and understand that so they can turn it into something beneficial for people who are losing memory. From a security and intelligence uh, standpoint, it is a really unique uh, opportunity to begin to discover can you administer a drug that enhances human memory for a certain number of hours? Does it have to be permanent? So rather than carrying technical toys somewhere to try and record and collect information, your brain just remembers it, which doesn't give anybody anything really to detect. So that's one potential use for it, and that is one lane of research uh, that's going on around uh, an aversive experience, and you can transfer that memory to the brain of another fruit fly by manipulating uh, the rods. Uh, and it gives it a memory for something that it's never had before, and then it reacts to the stimulus in the same way as the animal who did have the aversive learning uh, experience. It's been done in mice. I'll talk a little bit about what Beth Loftus and I have done to men and women going through Sears school and changing memory. Uh, and I put the last slide up because this is in flatworms, and this came out two years ago, that memory really is something beyond what we uh, typically understand in flatworms. You can cut their head off, and their body still remembers stuff. So the, uh, they're just beginning to uncode or decode where and how is memory stored in the body of this little creature 
so we can translate that into memory in animals that look different than that little creature. It's evolved it for a very interesting reason. So this is this, in 2009 using light. They've transferred, uh, they transferred tried to get together and run up to Brunswick to Sears School and try a memory experiment. This is our design. If you're not familiar with Sears, there's a classroom phase, there's an experiential phase. We were interested in so you guys get the idea when they were in okay. so the interrogation. What did they argue about? We can hear was that if you give so now, students. Student Gahab starts with. Gahab starts with that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would warn those people who what? Who would say Allah has adopted a son. And Student Gahab basically is ending with this statement that those people who think they're doing good deeds, this is everyone, they think they're doing good deeds. This is why they're doing it. They're thinking that we're making a better future. They think that we're going to enhance humanity. And that even the works of, of good people, I'm not talking about Muslim or non-Muslim, just good human beings, the works of those good human beings is taken and then used by the evil people. This is what's been happening. So they take the work of the, the poor person that was very intelligent, you know, and they gave him all the props and, you know, we're going to use this to cure cancer. But later on, they understood we can use the same technology for surveillance. We can use the same technology for other, other, re other reasons. That's where we're going. And so now, you know, the jazz, what does the jazz represent? He represents the peak of that manufacturing of human beings. You know, he will be like the way the prophet describes him. He'll be able to cut a human being in half and put him back together. He will, he will, from a technology perspective, there will be no difference between the Jal and Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Isa alayhi salatu wasalam can do miracles. The Jal can show you the same miracles that Isa alayhi salatu wasalam does. There's going to be no, there's going to be no difference when he claims that he's the Messiah. Because when this technology falls, and you know, the Prophet said that uh, the resources of the world will follow him like honey follows a bee, uh, the, the bee follows honey, or Something of this nature, Prophet said, Oh, come back on us. But the point is, you know, the Prophet talks about how he'll be able to go around the world, how he'll be able to say something, and the whole world will hear him. And it's not just that the whole world will hear him. We're at a point where you can get, you can talk, and literally every person can hear things that they want to hear. Like the person's talking, and you think he's talking to the world, but everyone's getting the information that they're getting in their mind is the information that he wants to be delivered into your specific mind, okay? And so, you know, all this technology at a time where it'll all have crumbled, and this is my feeling, because of the wars and other reasons, that a lot of the technology for the common masses will be gone, okay? And the common masses will be back to the swords and this situation. And there are many reasons to believe that, looking at the Quran. Um, so, now, with that in mind, the Jal is going to be the peak of this, uh, this technology. And when you create a universe, a world, a generation, right? A generation has to be told now. Like our children and grandchildren need to be told now. This is going to happen. Don't forget Allah because that's technology that puts you so much in control. You know, uh, one of the good things I read, uh, Allah may uh one of the things I read recently is that as soon as you give choice to anyone, that's power. And power leads to arrogance. You know, the fact that Shaytan could say no is was a choice. And choice is, is, is connected with arrogance. The fact that you think you have a choice, right? And as long as angels know we don't have a choice, they have no choice but to surrender to Allah. But the minute you give someone a choice, choice and arrogance are interconnected. And so... Here, you're not giving them just one simple choice, right? You're like, you're, you're making them mini gods. You're making them like Batman. You can, and, and there are people like I talked about yesterday, I think Stephen Pinker and others who think about taking our consciousness and putting it into like a computer that by that computer that they can do virtually any. We're already spending, uh, a lot of us are spending more time virtually than we're in reality. And in the virtual world, you can do anything. And so when you have this technology on the one side, you have the virtual world where you can do anything. You can do things with mind control. 
Imagine the first mind control toy that will come out, right? That will probably happen in the next 20 years. Then, you know, the question of soul, if we can read the brain and we know what's inside the brain and we know what's inside the human being and we control the mind, then the question of soul becomes questionable. Anyway, you become so materialistic and you're given so many powers and you manufacture so much. And this is what brings on the era. So, so the God talks about the beginning and the end. The beginning is, the end is first. He will say, I'm God. I'm the son of God. That's the end, where it starts with. But where will it begin? It will begin with, it will begin with Dijal having the capacity to bring together all of the production, all of the manufacturing of all of the technology combined with jinns and combined with magic and all that he presented to the world and he will prove to the world that he's God. He will prove to the world that I am a Nabi of Allah. I'm the Messiah. I'm the one you've been waiting for. That's, you know, uh, so that's the, that's the, that's the, the, the level of deception we're looking at. So our kids need to be very clear the future generation needs to be very clear about where everything is going. Everything is because we need to tell them now that the Quran tells us about this manufacturing. The Quran tells us that the dunya could be made into like a place of Jannah, right? That dunya can be made into like this really awesome place and it should not be used to deny Allah. And it starts all with uh, being away from nature and being away from the ayat of Allah subhanahu so over here, very quickly, let's now go back. Uh, go back. Um, let's see if I can. Okay. Now with this in mind, now that I've showed you, now keep this following in mind. Qul, O Prophet وسلم, say to them, Should I tell you, should I inform you? With the actions that are the worst and the worst, they make you a loser. You think a'mal is generally used, the word amal. Fa'al, fa'al, fa'ala, fa'ala, he did. Okay, amal, he did too. The difference is amal generally means an action that you think is meaningful and purposeful. Okay, has some intent behind it. Should we tell you all with the worst of actions? Those who there's now imagine all the research, hours and hours and hours and hours of research, and all the effort and all the effort and all the effort, all their those whose effort, their sa'ya, their effort, their jihad, so to say. The effort has what gone to waste. Their effort has led them astray is another trend. In the life of this world. But what were they thinking? But they were thinking, they were calculating that they all they were perfecting. Hasan, Hasin means beautiful. Okay. Hasan means good and beautiful. So I'll just go over the words here. Dalla means he lost, lost way, went astray. Sa'ya means to move steadily, to run, to proceed, to go at warp speed. Okay. Yahsabuna, they were thinking to consider. Uh, I'm surprised he didn't. Uh, oh, Yahsabuna. Uh, I'm surprised he didn't say the word to calculate. Yuhsinuna, they did good, performed well. It should also say the word uh, beautiful. Okay, sunah to perform to produce. Remember the tree that was at that ukulaha. It came with its full produce. It's full. It's full. Walam dadlim min shay'a. Didn't hold back anything. Brought everything out. Full produce. Full manufacturing. Full results. So in reference to the fact that this is sutul kahab and it relates to the jad and the times of the jad. So these ayat, they're pointing to the direction that we're going in today. Okay. 
الذي ظل سعيهم في الحياة الدنيا وهم يحسنون that they will be thinking أنهم يحسنون that they will be making beautiful perfected sunah your manufacturing الذي ظل أولئك الذين كفروا but in fact what they were doing was based upon kufr of Allah which was أولئك الذين كفروا بآيات ربهم because they had done kufr with the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa liqa'ihi and to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa fahabitat a'maluhum so their actions became zero either in this world or the next world فَلَا نُقِيمُ لَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَزْنَا so there will be no wait for what they did for them on the لَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ on the day of judgment وَزْنَا there will not be any وَزْن there will be any wait on the scale of balances for them on the day of judgment okay Now, uh, let me just go to the verse before this, the verse that we actually left off. After the event of Surah Al-Qanayn, where he talks about the wall, and he says, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ja'alahu dhakka, wa kana wa'adu rabbi haqqa. The wall will come down and the promise of my Rabb is true. Now, in this now, understand now, this side-by-side -side contrast, on the one side is technology, and on the other side will be what? وَتَرَكْنَا بَعْدَهُمْ And we will leave, and تَرَكْنَا means to leave. تَرَكْنَا بَعْدَهُمْ Some of them. يَوْمَ إِذِنْ On that day. So we will leave some of them on that day. Meaning that day, which day? Which day has been talked about? Which day has been formed? So what is the day of judgment? But over here it's talking about from the time that that wall breaks. And it is very possible that the walls that I showed you will break to war in the upcoming times because you know this is real close to Turkey. And you know Turkey will be invaded and this is clearly in the heavens. And if Turkey gets invaded, this whole area will be destroyed. And those walls will, that what even remains, will all come down. Then on that day, okay. So one meaning of this is what what meaning we we will we will let go or we will leave, but let go is better translation. We will let go some of it, some of them or some of it. Okay, بعضهم, some of them, or some of them as in it, not as in people. Yoma even on that day. Yamuju biban to to move into the one another. One meaning of this is one fitna after another fitna. When that wall comes down or when it begins to come down, okay, then that from that day it will be one, there will be no end. There'll be no fa'inna ma'nos yusra in the sense after every is, is their hardship. No. It'll be one difficulty after another difficulty after another. One fitna after another fitna. Today is COVID-19. Tomorrow will be its mutation. Then there will be another deadly mutation. And then another thing and then another thing and another thing. And simultaneously many things and simultaneously. And each time the Prophet said what? Each time you'll think this is it. This is the end. Right? So, uh tarakna on that day when that time comes and it'll roll into one one fitna will come to just and you know a wave comes at peak right what why a wave a wave has a peak and a low so when the wave reaches its peak and then when it's as it's coming down another wave comes okay and then as that's coming down, another wave comes. So you hardly get a break from one fitna. The next fitna has already started. And then the trumpet will be blown. So we will collect them that day on the day of collecting. And we will put forward. Okay. Jahannam yawma idhim kafirina araba. We will put the hellfire in front of the people that denied the truth in full display to put before them. Who are they? They were the people that were manufacturing. 
الذي كانت اعينهم غطاء ذكر those people whose eyes were غطاء ذكر those people who didn't see me وكانوا لا يستطيعون سمع and they weren't able to hear the truth they weren't able to see the truth they weren't able to hear the truth and then what أفحسب الذين كفروا did those people calculate that that did kufr and yet تخذوا that they would take عبادي من دوني my servants meaning this Dajjal is a servant of Allah it's a creation of Allah as 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 their awliya as their protector okay or any of the shayateen that are under shaytan under iblis uh, through the through the you know the waswasas of shaytan and magic and all of this أحسب الذين كفروا أن يتخذوا or this this aliens that are supposedly coming down that the recent most recent uh, you know uh this uh, announcement was made that we are in contact Israel 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 I think someone in Israel made the um, announcement we're in touch with the aliens and so on and so forth that they'll take that you will have a protector other than you right so when there's wars then you'll be looking for a protector and someone who comes and saves you you're going to be like you know and congrats to you for saving us you must be sent from God. Oh yes, I'm sent from God. And I'm also a prophet of God. And by the way, I have enough resources to show you I'm the Messiah. And he'll do his magic. And he'll say, I'm not only just the Messiah, I'm saving you. I'm also the God. I'm also with God. Indeed, we have prepared Jahannam, the hellfire, lil kafirin for the disbelievers, Nuzula, as, a, as the initial entertainment. This is the beginning. Of that entertainment. Then Allah says, Should I tell you of the worst of the deeds? Those people whose whose effort has been put to naught. Okay? But they were thinking, they were hoping, they were wanting, they were calculating that they would make the best of manufacturing. This manufacturing is the deed that they did. Okay? That put them in trouble. These are the people that have done kufr. The ayat of Rabbihim. It started with denying the signs of Allah. Challenging nature instead of looking to nature as this is the creation of Allah. This is nature. It's perfect. How can we benefit from this? You know, you wanted to then manipulate nature. Okay? So then their good deeds are destroyed. Then there will be no wait for them on the day of judgment. This is the reward for them, is the help. Look how much emphasis is being put here. And you can see the, if you notice the words, you'll see the, the almost the anger. Okay, the emphasis of anger here. Over and over again. Look, you did this. Their reward again will be Jahannam because of their kufr. This is the biggest punch, my dear, for the believers. Their reward will be Jahannam because of the kufr that they did. What was the kufr here? Over there, it mentioned manufacturing as their action. That's the actions. The iman will be the kufr of the ayat of Allah. Okay. Now here, what will they do with the truth? And they adopted my signs and my prophet as huzwa, as something light, as a joke. Oh, what is Muhammad? What did Muhammad sallallahu alaihi We can splice the gene. We can make the gene do anything. What did Muhammad know about anything? Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They took a line as messenger that is a joke because that 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 choice, that power that gave them the arrogance to think so. There's something, that they're on something, that they have something, right? But I call it junk science because these things are not useful in, the, in, in terms of the scheme of the purpose of being on earth, okay? But on the other hand, as always, Allah gives us a contrast. Indeed, those who have iman, Allah Jalal, and do the good deeds, 
for them will be Jannah, many guardians of Firdaus, Nuzula as the initial entertainment. Khalidina fiha, in it they will remain. They won't have the Jannah of the world. That will be the choice that they'll have to make. That there will come a time where the believer will have to decide, do I want the Jannah of the world and what it all represents? And that it means I'm under control, I'm un under their tutelage. So whatever it means, خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا in it they will remain. لَا يَغْمُونَ عَنْهَا فِيهَا They will not desire anything to change. They will be so satisfied, they will not want any change there. The next ayah is very, very important, but I'll only translate it for you uh, right now and we'll give the explanation later because it requires a... And so in terms of what I want to do, I think we're going to have three more classes and we'll finish everything. I hope, inshallah, those of you, uh, some of you or all of you, inshallah, can bear with me three more classes, meaning three more weeks. Two more weeks or three more weeks, I will, inshallah, finish everything. Uh, we, I'm thinking I will, next week, I'll finish the whole of Skudgahab in terms of the meaning and translation. And then the next two weeks or one week, we're going to finish off in grammar. So the last two weeks we're going to do in grammar. And then after that, you all have your assignments and tests. And then after that, so we're done, inshallah. And then I will announce new classes after that, depending upon the situation, inshallah. Right now, I'm thinking what big classes I should have. So this is, uh, I'm actually not going to translate ion number 109 uh, right now. Um, but what I will do is I will open up the floor for any questions right now, and then we will. Uh, uh, then we'll, inshallah, review some things again and take it from there. So if there's any questions or if you have any comments, then inshallah, this is the time to uh, say something. No comments? Sometimes it doesn't show me. Oh, Imran has, yes, brother Imran, please. Assalamu uh, uh, Yeah, wa alaikum as um, uh, I, I had a question. question. Um, have, have you, you ever, ever listened, listened to, to Surah, Surah al-Rahman and, and seen the, the link, link between, between the, evil the evil community, evil community of, of human and, and evil jinn? And, and that, that community, community is responsible, responsible for, for all, all of this technology? technology? Yeah, so for example, you know, it seems that, uh, you know, especially the verse of the Quran, like this verse and many other verses of the Rahman seem to indicate that, you know, there's definitely, because Allah is addressing both humans and jinns in this world. So then there's some, you know, relationship between the two. So, so uh, there is definitely Surah Rahman is the surah the Prophet was reading when the jinns heard him, as you know, the shayateen jinns. And so there's a lot I have to say on Surah Rahman, but uh, in short, the answer is yes, there is a relationship there. Yes, we can inshallah do another class of Surah Rahman. Obviously, there will be fresh students. The vocab will be the same, but some of the uh, tafsir will be different in the next classes. Yeah, so uh, I was thinking also a class of logic, which would include how to look at the news and interpret the news. Uh, that's one class. I'm also thinking of doing a class on how to teach people to do ruqya, to deal with, because every house should have aspects in it that protect us from the shayatim and the jinns. And, uh, and uh, I'm also thinking of doing tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah, or the first juz, rather. And that would be like the second stage of the Arabic class itself. So the first stage is Surah al and then the second stage will be Surah Al-Baqarah. And, uh, and so then the next part, I think from page 140 to 290 of uh, Noman's book, will be part of that. And so, uh, 
So inshallah, that's that's what I'm thinking. So what did you guys think of uh, today's class? In terms of these verses of the Quran that we just went through. Yeah, so what we have to practically do, you know, we have to think about how are we going to inculcate Iman in our children and grandchildren at a time where they don't feel like they need God. You know, they might even acknowledge, okay, some, there is a God out there. It's human for God, so they acknowledge it. But that sense of I need God, like the way fish needs water, <clears throat> That will be much less. Everything will be virtual. Everything will be automated. And technology will be, you know, you can even do mind control. It'll be like, what's the purpose of something supernatural if you can do this now? What's, what's the big deal in parting the seeds? What's the big deal in bringing someone back to life? What's the big deal in, you know, the miracles that Quran mentions? If you can do it with technology, then I mean, what's the big deal? So then you have to come up with a narrative that explains that. The fact that we can do that now uh, and that these same things were mentioned before, for example, uh, alludes to the truthfulness of it in the sense that, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this without the knowledge we have today, but he did it back then, so to say. So that's one way to look at it. But uh, elite don't give their kids tech. They have nothing but distractions. Uh, uh, so yeah. Um, um, also, is, uh, is, is there, there a, a, a relation to autism in GG? Is there what? A relation, a relation to, to autism in GG. For autism, I think it has more to do with the vaccines uh, than, than genes. I have had couples bring their kids to me and, uh, you know, they can check, see if, you know, genes are affecting my child because they have autism. And uh, even though I do see that the genes meddle with anyone who is, you know, uh, they can meddle with their brain more easily than a normal person, but I didn't see anything specific. Now, there's a lot of research on uh, autism uh, that, I don't remember what the name of the books are right now, but let me see. I've heard from parents because you know a lot of parents come to me that uh, autism and gut uh, nutrition specific need for the gut. Uh, these types of books have helped a lot uh, to those parents. So nutrition may be one key in helping the child. Uh, because, you know, uh, it could be because of vaccines, but one way to get rid of vaccines, and I'm only sharing this with you guys because, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this. And I know some brothers that are also very concerned about the whole scenario we're in. So, Let's say we're forced to take vaccines, what do we do? Well, you fast for 10 days, take nothing but water. And the reason I say this, that will completely clean out your gut, completely. Uh, you know, the energy these genes need to survive, the energy that they need from the body. So you basically shut down the body, and then you shut them, you, you shut down their supply, okay? And so if you fast for like literally 10 days, don't take anything but water, it sh and, and, and the reaction that has in the body is the body just starts to re renew itself, meaning the body will say, okay, wait, this is not working. There's something wrong with the whole body because the body's getting no food for like five days. The body goes into hyper mode and says, wait, I need to get rid of this body and make a new body. And so everything becomes, it, the body rejuvenates everything from the beginning. Um, and so uh, one thing that, I, I, I mean, I, you can try with uh, autistic kids. It's possibly uh, a type of fast where the whole body, because if it's because of vaccines and stuff or something, 
uh, that's been put into the body, then everything will be flushed out if you make them fast for the three days. But I don't have a good answer. That's the best answer I have right now. Yeah, so in the biotech industry, what happens is maybe one out of a 500 companies succeed in doing it. You know, most of them, they don't succeed much. But what happens is that, you know, if they get a little bit farther and then another big company sees them, and then the little company sees, you know, we're not going to get very far, but we have a very good idea. We have very good technology. And they give them a few million dollars and they say, okay, bye bye, we're taking the technology. So the big company keeps all that, you know, technology. Yes, they say it's genetic. But uh, as you know, autism went on the rise after the 1970s. And uh, so I think that, you know, using uh, Islamic medicine, we can cure it, but we need to have some proper experiments and proper procedure and proper uh, way of looking into it. Okay, inshallah, let me. Okay, since it doesn't seem like anyone has any questions, inshallah, I will see you all again next week. Let's try to wrap everything off, inshallah, next week in terms of tafsir. And then the week. Uh, meeting the next class, and then we will do three classes on grammar and try to catch up to where we're supposed to be. And then after that, I will decide what to do in terms of the uh, exam and certification and all of that. Okay, Jazakum Al Khair and see you